Mobile Suit Gundam 00 was a huge breath of fresh air after watching Gundam Seed Destiny. 00 is the first series to be split into two distinct seasons, as well as being the first Gundam show to be broadcast in glorious full widescreen HD. Keep in mind that during this video, I've only seen the first season, so if I bring up questions that are answered in the second season, well, I'll correct myself in that video, I guess. While Seed and its sequel suffered the obvious growing pains of being the franchise's first fully digital production, Double O's art style, animation, and framing of action is leagues ahead of what we got in Destiny. Double O was directed by Seiji Mizushima, who's known for his work on things like Slayer's Next, Full Metal Alchemist, and the original Shaman King anime. Not that Netflix crap. <laughs> Not that Netflix sh**. Keep it away from me. Gundam Double O is a show that I really ended up appreciating over the course of its 25 episode first season. This is a show that was spawned out of the political climate of the late 2000s, and I gotta say the writers had some balls. They do not shy away from showing acts of terror, child soldiers, regular people being affected by political violence, and the effects of rampant imperialism. As a good old American boy myself, I do recognize the criticism of the West's involvement in the Middle East right off the bat, and it's a pretty big focus. Along with the near constant focus on political backroom deals and the near future setting that takes place just on the cusp of space travel and colonization, well, it all melds together to create a very politically charged show that has a lot to say. And I guess no one should really be surprised it is the Gundam franchise after all. Double O is a series that takes itself very seriously, becomes entangled in the web of its own political intrigue, and as such can become confusing at points if you're not super paying attention. It is really a show that demands your full attention to get the most out of it. In turn, I think that makes it really fun to talk and speculate about. So let's get into my thoughts on Mobile Suit Gundam Double O. Unlike other Gundam stories that take place many years into the future, Gundam 00 begins in our own Gregorian calendar, specifically the year 2307. The world is a familiar one, though the use of fossil fuels have fallen to the wayside in favor of massive solar power generators. Due to the expense of creating the means of producing this type of power, which includes constructing an orbital platform and gigantic space elevator, most countries have assimilated into one of the three major economic blocks. The Union of Solar Energy and Free Nations, which is based primarily in North America, the Human Reform League that is composed mostly of Russia and China, as well as India and many countries in South Asia, and finally the Advanced European Union, which is made up of the countries of Europe and some in Africa. We come into this story at the tail end of a 20 year long solar power war, which has plunged the world's poorest populations into bloody strife due to the restriction of fossil fuel exports. As you can imagine, many countries that rely upon exporting oil as their main form of commerce, many countries in the Middle East, were just thrown into complete poverty, with some factions even seeing it as a holy war to be fought. Terrorism runs rampant throughout all three economic blocks, and the development of highly advanced mobile suits has become a necessity to guard the vulnerable space elevators. This is where episode one begins, as AEU hotshot pilot Patrick Colasauer is presenting a brand new mobile suit called the Enact to various personnel. His impressive display is cut short by the arrival of a white mobile suit, which takes it out with no effort. Piloting the white mobile suit known as the GN-001 Gundam Exia is Setsuna F. Seiei, a young man who has only one goal in life, to become Gundam. 
The Exia is impressive right off the bat, and perhaps the most striking thing about it, and by extension the rest of the Gundam class suits in the show, is that it's powered by a large cone-shaped drive on its back, called the GN Drive. The drive allows the Gundams to fly through the air, almost weightless, like some sort of angel. On top of that, it puts out something called GN particles. Much like the Universal Century's Minovsky particles, these GN particles have the side effect of blocking communications, giving the Gundam pilots a huge advantage over those piloting standard mobile suits. Setsuna is pretty content with wrecking the brand new Enact and then just leaving, which is pretty badass, not gonna lie. It isn't long before we learn that Setsuna is a member of a group called Celestial B, an armed force that seeks to eradicate all war on Earth through the use of overwhelming force. Nope, no Relina-style pacifism here. In Gundam 00, the protagonists know that the only way they can stop the ever-turning Gears of War is by fighting fire with fire, which is a nice breath of fresh air, and it also means that a lot of the characters in the show exist within a morally gray area. It definitely makes the characters and factions within Gundam 00 more interesting, because their motivations are mostly understandable and realistic. Celestial Being also doesn't wait around to get into the action, as Setsuna meets up with one of his comrades, Lock on Stratus. Which, yes, that is the best Gundam name that has been in the entire franchise, and his machine, the long-range Gundam Dynamis. Setsuna reveals that the AEU was hiding mobile suit hangars inside of their space elevator, and so he continues showing the Exia's power by taking them all out. Meanwhile, in upper orbit, two more Gundam Meisters, Yes, the pilots are called Meisters in this show, which is essentially just a Germanic word for a skilled practitioner of a craft, not something made up for Final Fantasy X, which is what 11-year-old me thought at the time, defend the Human Reform League's high orbital station from a terrorist attack. Alleluia Haptism pilots the transforming Gundam Kyrios and successfully drives away the terrorists with the help of our fourth Meister, the androgynous Tieria Erde and his chonky boy Gundam Virtue. If all that wasn't enough for a first episode, reporters at the Japanese news network receive a transmission that is broadcast all over the world. A renowned scientist known as Aeolia Shenberg, who went missing 200 years ago, announces that he's created an armed organization called Celestial Being that will use the weapon known as Gundam to intervene in any armed conflict. They hope to use their power to eradicate all war across the Earth. And while that does sound kind of similar to Operation Meteor from Gundam Wing, Celestial Being is way more effective at it, at least at first. The first arc does so much to set up the world that at times it can be a little overwhelming. There are just so many characters and factions introduced to us in the first couple of episodes that it can be hard to keep track of. Though, as the series goes on, this initial uneasiness with the characters pays off in a pretty big way. We're introduced to civilians Louise and Saji, as well as Saji's sister Kinue, who works at JNN as an investigative reporter. Ram Aker and Billy Katagiri, who are members of the Union military, Colonel Smirnoff and Lieutenant Soma of the HRL, and that's really just scratching the surface. This arc proceeds with Celestial Being intervening in multiple conflicts across the globe, as their infamy grows and they become a thorn in the side of all three economic blocks. Setsuna and Lock-On usually work side by side, and I like that they put in some effort to make the mecha feel like huge lumbering machines. While this aspect of the series kind of fades away while the episode number grows, I always really love when mecha are treated like actual machines. We see them get equipped with different weapons or have downtime for maintenance. And while the Gundams themselves are all pretty cool and unique, the Meisters are just as weird as the mecha that they pilot. While Lock-On is probably the most level-headed, amicable, and uh, handsome of the foursome, all of them have qualities that make them interesting to watch and interact with each other. At the end of the day, Lock-On Stratus locked onto my heart. 
Of course, Setsuna is the edgy Gundam boy and youngest of the group, but honestly, beyond the I am Gundam memes that he spouts, Setsuna is actually a pretty deep character with some really complicated and interesting motivations. He joins up with Celestial Being after being saved by a Gundam as a child, during a holy war that he was taking part in as a child soldier. Yeah, Setsuna just might have the darkest backstory of any Gundam lead in the series. Plus, I kinda respect Gundam 00 for having its main character be of Middle Eastern descent, which is something you really don't see very often, especially not back in 2007. Alleluia Haptism seems pretty normal at first, if a little emo, but that kinda goes out the window when his murderous alter ego, Hallelujah, comes into play. This is due to Alleluia being subject to the Human Reform League's Super Soldier program as a child. Now he has to deal with something called Quantum Brainwaves, which aren't a huge factor in the first season, but cause him to have terrible migraines and pass out when in close proximity to other Super Soldiers. Finally, there is Tiaria Erde, the androgynous purple-haired Gundammeister that starts out as a real asshole and kinda mellows out by the end. Tiaria has the least amount of backstory of all the Gundam Meisters, at least in Season 1, but he has the most amount of mystery surrounding him. Tiaria mentions trying to understand what it means to be human throughout the series, and he's the only member of Celestial Being that can directly interface with the group's supercomputer, Beta. Speaking of the group as a whole, Celestial Being mostly consists of members of the mobile suit carrier, Ptolemyos or Ptolemy for short. Good thing I'm a fan of sci-fi stuff naming ships after ancient philosophers and scientists. The most standout members of the crew are Sumeragi Noriega, the de facto commander and combat forecaster, Ian Vashti, the ship's main mechanic, and the rest of the bridge crew, Felt, Chris, Lichty, and Lasse, who spend most of their time aboard the ship as backup and support for the Gundam Meisters. Sumeragi is the standout of the crew for me personally, not only because of, uh, well, you know, but also because she's the most human out of all of them. She struggles with the ghosts of her past, and when things get really bad, she falls into the bottom of a glass to cope. There's just something incredibly relatable about her that I appreciate. For the most part, that goes for all of the characters that make up Celestial Being. While there are anime tropes here and there, all of the Meisters have actual reasons for seeing the world the way that they do. There's depth behind the memory that is I Am Gundam, which really just makes the show all the better, because while I appreciate the complexity of the characters, I do also love edgy anime bullshit. I think one of the things I was most surprised with in Gundam 00 was that the action was just so good throughout the entire series. Maybe Seed and Seed Destiny primed me to think that I'd be seeing reused animation all the time, but I was very pleasantly surprised by how great and fluid the action was. Plus, there are some really great hype moments in the show that really make watching a joy. The opening arc of Gundam 00 is mostly made up of one or two episode long vignettes that illustrate the power of the Gundams and the ideals of Celestial Beings. We see the group intervene in conflicts across all three economic blocks, and in turn we see how their infamy grows, and how both common people and the higher-ups of the government react. One country, called Terribia, even tries to secede from the Union while still claiming their right to use the nearby space elevator, all because they believe Celestial Being would intervene and stop the Union from destroying them. And you know, it, it actually isn't a terrible plan, because Celestial Being does go to fight in Terribia, even though they know they're being used because it's what they do. However, instead of stopping the Union from attacking Terribia, the Meisters just attack Terribia on their own, exclaiming that Celestial Being will attack any country that incites war by any means. Once the powers that be get their act together and decide that Celestial Being is an actual threat, we get introduced to a few characters in each faction that work as foils for the Gundam Meisters. My personal favorite is Graham Aker, the blonde-haired American ace that pilots the very patriotic Union flag. Graham is used by the writers to show how weighty and visceral the combat in Gundam 00 can be. 
Being essentially a fighter jet pilot, Graham throws his MS around into high G maneuvers that put such stress on his body that he coughs up blood, and he's one of the only enemy pilots that can keep up with the Gundams. And that's before the Union or any of the other blocks has access to technology that can rival Celestial Being. In fact, later on in the show, when the Anti-Gundam Task Force receives their upgraded mobile suits, Graham continues to pilot his flag custom, and you know what? He fights on par with Setsuna and the Gundam Exia the whole time. Hats off to you, Graham, because that's actually incredibly impressive in the context of this show. From the Human Reform League, we have both Colonel Smirnov, aka the Bear of Russia, and his young protege, Lieutenant Soma Pires, a white-haired experimental super soldier that has the ability to use quantum brainwaves and super reaction speed. Perhaps her most useful ability is the fact that she can send Alleluia into a complete freakout because of their brainwave interference. Of course, Alleluia and Soma being from the same super soldier program is a story thread that causes the two to clash near constantly, and her interference is what brings the alter ego of Hallelujah out most often. As for the relationship between Soma and Smirnov, I actually think it's really sweet, as he sees her as only one step above using child soldiers, and so the old officer constantly looks out for her, almost like a father and daughter relationship. Finally, from the AEU is Colonel Katie Mannequin, who is a tactical forecaster and commander. She works as a foil to Sumeragi and echoes her role in Celestial Being, along with her underling Patrick from the opening episode. Unfortunately, these guys get the least amount of development in Season 1, especially Patrick, who's mostly just a joke. However, one final rival pilot that constantly causes trouble for our main characters is a mercenary known as Ali al Sachez. Originally hailing from the same homeland as Setsuna, the country of Krugis, Ali is a self-described warmonger, a man that seeks violence and chaos like a hungry dog seeks its next meal. He also goes by the alias Gary Biaggi and fights for the French Foreign Legion under the AEU, truly the scariest man named Gary that has ever been. Not long into the series, Setsuna has the Gundam Exia outfitted with some brand new GN blades, and now it can fully live up to its project name of the Gundam Seven Swords. Yeah, that is something that I really like about the main Gundam. It's mainly a melee-focused machine with a relatively light loadout, specialized in getting right up in the enemy's face. It's definitely a nice breath of fresh air, after the beam spam that Gundam can sometimes devolve into. The AEU sets its sights on a small country called Moralia that is home to the collective of private military companies called the PMC Trust. They aim to use the resources of the PMCs there to help complete their space elevator. Of course, sending AEU troops into Moralia triggers an armed intervention by Celestial Being, and this causes Setsuna to come face to face with Ali, perhaps the man he hates most in the world. Setsuna hates Ali so much that they end up both getting out of their cockpits, and this causes Setsuna to immediately have a flashback to his childhood, where he was forced to kill his own parents during the Holy War in Krugis. Yeah, I said his backstory was probably the darkest out of all the Gundam boys, and being brainwashed into murdering your own family as a child soldier is pretty heavy. Setsuna battles Ali, but has a hard time keeping up since Ali is the one who taught him everything and knows all his moves. Luckily, the tide of battle starts to turn as the Gundams overpower the PMC soldiers, and we even see that the AEU response is basically... well, shit as they cut their losses and retreat. The Gundams target Moralia's HQ and win the battle, though the casualties are pretty high. This show does not shy away from showing how the actions of Celestial Being have consequences and how the members of the group struggle with it. Especially Sumeragi, who isn't super happy about the fact that they've caused civilian casualties. Due to Celestial Being's actions, terrorist attacks start occurring all throughout the globe, and this is where the side story of Saji and Louise really started to click for. We see the two teens get caught in a bus bombing, 
and it shows how their lives are affected by the actions of Celestial Being, and showing us how their lives are affected by both Celestial Being and their enemies goes a long way to emotionally connect us to the plot. Soon after the battle in Moralia, Celestial Being's attention is turned towards the Middle Eastern country of Azadistan. Throughout the early episodes of Gundam 00, we've been following a character named Princess Marina Ishmael as she tries to secure aid for her ailing country. Much like the other countries of the Middle East, Azadistan fell into extreme poverty when oil exports were cut off by the three economic powers, and her country is now split between two factions, the conservatives who follow religious leader Rahmadi, and the moderates who are currently in power. Princess Marina is less than successful during the opening episodes of Gundam 00, and we see her get turned away from pretty much every major economic power. Marina had previously met Setsuna and had saved him from the police while he was attempting to chase down a terrorist. Setsuna really goes against Celestial Being's MO here as he reveals that he's a pilot for them and reveals his true name, Soran Ibrahim. Marina had saved Setsuna because she mistakenly thought he was from Azadistan, when he was really from Krugis, which happens to be the country that Azadistan destroyed and assimilated during Setsuna's childhood. He tells Marina that if she doesn't get things under control in Azadistan, the celestial being's gonna pay him a little visit. While all this is going on with Setsuna and his princess, Alleluia is taking on his own mission. We know he was a former super soldier for the HRL, and anytime he comes near Lieutenant Soma, he gets intense migraines, which cause his psychotic alter ego, Hallelujah, to take over. We learn that Alleluia still knows where the super soldier program is headquartered, and after talking to Subaragi, he heads there with the intention to blow the entire thing up. At first, he can't pull the trigger, knowing that inside the building are child super soldier experiments. Hallelujah offers to take over and do the deed, but Alleluia finally pulls the trigger and flies away, knowing that he didn't want the HRL to destroy any more lives. Celestial Being would quickly become embroiled in the fight for her homeland, as the tension between the conservatives and the moderates boils over when their religious figurehead, Rasa Rahmadi, is kidnapped. No one really knows who kidnapped him. Some believe that the moderates wanted to cut the head off of the proverbial snake, while others think that the conservatives may have kidnapped him themselves to kick off the conflict. Either way, attacks escalate in Azadistan, and Marina worries that Celestial Being are going to show up and destroy the entire country. At the same time, a dashing man named Alejandro Corner has shown up in the war-torn country. Alejandro is from the UN and has offered Marina a deal to provide support for her. But many within its borders do not like the prospect of outsiders meddling in their affairs. Along with Alejandro is a young man named Ribbons Allmark, and the show takes extra special care to always show us his little smirk behind Alejandro's back. Keep that one in mind for later. The fighting in Azadistan becomes so serious that a woman is able to break her way into the palace and almost kill Marina before being shot by her guards. Good thing their bullets didn't go through her and kill the princess. Setsuna finds out that the group responsible for kidnapping Rahmadi is led by Ali, so he sends Lock on the coordinates for one of Ali's nearby safe houses that he remembers from the war in Krugis. This is where I have to introduce another character. I apologize for the plot explanation being a little scatterbrained, but there are like 67 characters in this show and they're all interesting. Anyway, Wang Lu Mei is an undercover agent for Celestial Being, along with her attendant Hong Long. Mostly she is the one who is sending the Ptolemy crew info that her spy network collects. Hong Long and Lock On are able to recover Rachmati, and I gotta say, Lock On just sniping dudes from the cockpit of the Dynamis is just badass. Put the up down, you noob. Do you suck on stop again? Pick up a real gun. Pick up a real gun. Setsuna and the Gundam Exia return to the Azadistan Palace, and despite being shot at by the palace guard, returns Rahmadi peacefully. This actually starts to confuse public opinion on Celestial Being, as some people start to see them as a net good for the world. However, that's not something that could continue to last, as Celestial Being starts to have issues from the inside. Overall, the arc that compromises the conflicts of Moralia and Azadistan does a lot to give the audience a feel for the international politics of the world. 
there's a lot that I didn't even mention here as I just can't include everything in this video. But I don't suggest going into Gundam 00 thinking that you can just sort of casually pay attention while phone scrolling. Every episode is packed to the brim with backroom conversations and political exposition. And it's all really interesting and then made even better by how good the mecha battles in the show really are. With Celestial Being becoming a larger and larger threat, all three economic blocks meet in secret and come up with a plan to rid themselves of the group once and for all. Using a terrorist attack on an HRL facility as bait to lure Celestial Being into the middle of the desert, a joint anti-Gundam task force launches a massive attack on the four Gundam Meisters. Fielding 52 teams with over 800 mobile suits, the Meisters fight for an entire day, and man, I, I really like this battle a lot. It really is the first time that Celestial Being feels as though they're pushed to their limit, just through the sheer number of enemy suits thrown at them. Despite having superior technology and weapons, there's no way they can win a war of attrition against the largest military ever seen on Earth. Each of the Meisters is battered and nearly captured, with characters like Graham, Soma, and Smirnoff coordinating the fights. Oh yeah, Patrick is also here, but he's an idiot and attacks Locke on alone and just gets blasted away. It looks like this might be the end of the line for Celestial Being. That is, until the arrival of a brand new Gundam. Piloted by a woman named Nana Trinity, the Gundam throne Dre, or Dry, it's it's a German word written to the story by a Japanese man, I, I, whatever, disperses a huge field of GN particles across the battlefield. This interrupts the communications all the way down to the individual units, causing the joint force to call a general retreat. While the Meisters are appreciative of the close save, they're also super concerned because literally no one else is supposed to have Gundams, and now there are three more of them. Nana's brothers Michael and Johan make up Celestial Being Trinity Team with the Gundam Throne units. Tieria is the most concerned of all as he says that Veda has no data on the Trinity Team or the Gundam Throne units. This leads him and Sumeragi to believe that Veda could have possibly been hacked by somebody. But at the end of the day, the more Gundam pilots, the better, right? Well, maybe that would be the case if the Trinities weren't complete psychos. These guys decide that the Ptolemy team isn't really doing their jobs well enough, so they start going around and doing armed interventions on their own. And also, they're just kind of jerks. When they come aboard the Ptolemy, one of the first things Nina does is kiss Setsuna against his will, which gets her a throat punch for her trouble. On top of that, Nana is shown being able to access Veda's terminal, which really pisses off the area. They also just completely refuse to answer any questions that the Ptolemy team have for them, basically saying that they need to leave it up to Faith and this is all part of Aeolia Shenberg's plan. But with the worry that somebody has hacked into Veda, who's to say that Team Trinity is really part of Celestial Being at all? And then of course there's Alejandro, who we see is not only a big shot at the UN, but also something known as an observer. His role seems to be overseeing Celestial Beings' actions to make sure they coincide with the plan, and there appear to be other unseen observers as well, though this season doesn't really give us much information on them. However, Alejandro is just too mysterious to not be a villain, so he's on the top of the suspicious men I think are hacking Veda list. While Celestial Being mainly concern themselves with intervening in conflicts that are already in progress, Trinity attacks bases and targets that aren't actively engaged in any sort of campaign. During one attack, they target and kill Dr. Ralph Eifman, the technical leader of the Union's anti-Gundam task force. Conveniently, as he was about to have a breakthrough in understanding Aeolia Shenberg's plans. Seems like a derelict spacecraft that went missing many years ago and was once again discovered near Jupiter might have something to do with the old scientist's plan. And perhaps he was creating Celestial Being for a reason other than peace. Team Trinity's rude-ass Purple Haro was also found on that ship, and in this setting, Haro are basically mobile data terminals with a connection to Veda. If destroying a random military base wasn't bad enough, Nana takes it upon herself to just like attack a random wedding at a villa in Spain, killing everyone there for literally no reason. 
Well, not everyone, as the wedding was a celebration being put on by the Halavi family, and the lone survivor is Louise. Saji drops everything and visits her in the hospital, even bringing her a set of rings that she wanted, only for it to be revealed that she lost her arm in the attack, and even with the advanced medical science, they can't regenerate it because of the GN particle radiation. So, that sucks. The episode ends with Saji and Louise going their separate ways, which I have to admit did kind of hit me hard. When you first start seeing Saji and Louise, they kind of come off as a distraction with some goofy humor. But I gotta say the humanity that these characters lend to the series overall was an incredibly good decision by the writing team. While our Gundam Meisters tend to be aloof when it comes to the violence that they cause, Saji and Louise provide a way for us to see the consequences of the state of the world from the eyes that we can easily empathize with. Now, this terror attack on the wedding is the final straw for both Setsuna and Lock-On, so they decide that it's time Team Trinity is brought down a peg. Despite acting all high and mighty, the Gundam throne units are outfitted with the pseudo-solar reactors instead of the full-fledged GN drives that Celestial Being have. This means that while they get most of the benefits that a suit like the Exia gets, they also run out of energy much faster and require more maintenance and downtime. Setsuna confronts all three throne units at once, proclaiming them an enemy of Celestial Being and saying that he is performing an armed intervention. One of the most badass moments in the show. While Setsuna's attack takes them off guard, it's the arrival of both Tiaria and Lock-On that causes the Trinities to flee. Before they run away with their tails between their legs, Johan Trinity reveals that Setsuna was a member of the terrorist group that was responsible for the bombing that killed most of Lock-On's family. What I do love about this revelation is that while Lock-On says that he does want to shoot Setsuna, he also realizes that Setsuna was literally a brainwashed child, and when Setsuna tells Lock-On that he knows Lock-On would carry their mission if he himself died, Lock-On just calls him a crazy bastard and they move on. While it seems that the Trinity team's time in the sun is coming to an end, the revelation that there are more solar reactors out there is quite a big deal, and the leaders of all three economic blocks receive a message from someone that claims to be from Celestial Being. This comes with the reveal that there is a facility in Antarctica filled with these pseudo-solar reactors, and now the world governments will have access to them, all because someone wants to take over Shenberg's plan from the shadows. For a final piece of info, Kinoe eventually digs up information regarding a man named Laguna Harvey, a big shot rich guy who owns JNN and a rail company that has its hands in building the orbital elevators, and it seems like he might have a little something to do with Celestial Being. However, Kinoe decides to keep this info from her boss and investigate by herself, thinking that the story would be squashed if anyone else knew about it. Going into the final arc of Gundam 00, all three economic blocks enter a military alliance under the United Nations, and the Gundam Meisters all head back to space. The Trinity's actions, combined with the core group of Celestial Being, have pissed off the world's governments enough that they hastily accept the pseudo-solar reactors and put them into a brand new mobile suit, the GNX-603T, or Jinx for short. Graham doesn't care for it, wanting to beat Celestial Being in his trusty flag custom, so he does not join the new anti-Gundam force, which is a shame because he's a great character. Alejandro can no longer work from the shadows, and it's revealed that he and Ribbons have been searching for Veda's core, which is on the moon because of course it is. My suspicions of Alejandro being the traitor are proven correct. I mean, it's pretty much out in the open from halfway through the series. Sumeragi and the rest of the Ptolemy crew no longer trust that the info that they get from Veda is in their best interest, so they take drastic measures and build a failsafe into the mechs that can cut them off from the supercomputer. Meanwhile, Kinue has finally gotten curious enough to look into Laguna Harvey, but has no luck getting near him. Unluckily for her, Alial Sachez also works for Harvey, and offers to answer some questions for her. And this scene is so creepy and disheartening. Maybe one of the only times I've said out loud, do not get in this scary man's car while watching. Ali reveals basically everything to Kinoe, only to stab her and leave her for dead in an alleyway. 
And this show just keeps piling on the shit for Saji as he has to confirm her dead body in the morgue. Poor Saji, man. What good setup for season two? Celestial Being prepares for the inevitable confrontation with the joint anti-Gundam task force. While Tieria takes it hardest out of everyone, as he was the one who relied upon Veda most of all, Setsuna also has a moment of self-doubt and even wonders if he wants to quit fighting. The Trinities are attacked in their base by Smirnoff and his new team of Jinx mobile suits, and we see how much the gap has closed between the Gundams and the other mechs. When the Ptolemy is attacked, we finally know that Celestial Beings' worries about Veda being used against them are true, and they even worry that their deaths may have been part of the plan since the beginning. The Gundams stop responding due to Veda's interference, but they're able to fight through it thanks to the subsystem that Sumeragi and Ian rigged up. Except for Tieria, who has to be saved by Lock-On because he just can't bring himself to cut off his contact with the computer. Lock-On saves Tieria, but his targeting eye is injured during the rescue. While Celestial Being wins this battle, it's by the skin of their teeth and they can no longer rely on their superior technology and GN stealth tactics to pull out a win. The Trinity team is also on the ropes as they come under attack from Smirnoff and Soma once more, and now that their base has been destroyed, they only have about 30% power left. And we even see Alejandro confirm that the Trinities are no longer of any use to him. Setsuna and La Se, who's been basically a background character up until right now, decide to perform an armed intervention on the Trinities and UN Joint Force, using the Exia and a brand new fighter craft slash transport vehicle, the GN Arms. When they arrive, they don't find the Trinities, instead coming across Ali, who has taken one of the Gundam thrones. Ali has been working for Alejandro, though more out of a sense of wanting to cause chaos than any sort of loyalty, and reveals that he killed Laguna Harvey, and then just murders both Michael and Johan? Setsuna and La Se fight Ali, and we see that Ali has access to Veda, making him an incredibly powerful foe. In fact, he probably would have won this battle if it weren't for Alejandro being really, really stupid. Up on the moon, Alejandro finally finds Veda's core, along with the cryogenically frozen body of Aeolia Shenberg himself. Alejandro reveals that his family has wanted to take over Shenberg's plan for generations, and while Ribbons hacks the multiple levels of Veda, Alejandro shoots Shenberg's unconscious body as a form of visceral revenge. Uh, too bad this trip's a dead man's switch that plays a pre-recorded message telling Celestial Being that they are the inheritors of the plan. Not only that, but it allows them to access the previously unknown power-up state called Trans Am. Trans Am is a pretty cool power-up all in all, being pretty similar to Kaioken from Dragon Ball. GN particles flood the Gundam and empower it, giving it the ability to increase its energy output by up to three times the normal amount. However, after a brief operation time, the machine is put into a low power state to recover, meaning that running out of time mid-battle is basically a death sentence. Sumeragi sends an urgent message to Setsuna and Lasei, telling them that the UN Jinx forces are attacking the Ptolemy. And with Lock-On injured, they only have two Gundams to defend them. That doesn't keep Lock-On from breaking out of his room and taking part in the battle. Even though his eye is damaged, he takes advantage of the newly revealed GN armor and the Gundam Dynamis to fight off Ali. After some of the best animation and music in the entire show, Lock-On is forced to exit the damaged Dynamis, hook his targeting scope into a floating gun platform, and blast Ali though his platform is hit with a beam and then explodes. While the Gundam Meisters all react to Lock-On's death in their own way, I feel the worst for Haro, who's been by his side since episode 1, and is now reduced to just repeating Lock-On's name over and over again. The remaining Meisters all want to launch an all-out attack against the UN force, though Sumeragi would rather flee and live to fight another day. They don't have time to discuss it, as after a small amount of downtime, an alarm blares, and the UN forces come to attack the Ptolemy once again. This time, the fleet is spearheaded by a huge golden over-the-top mobile armor piloted by none other than Alejandro, and has the ability to fire huge beams. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm sorry. In the script, I, I instead of writing fire huge beams, I wrote fire huge beans. <laughs> oh, how delicious. It has the ability to fire huge beams from super far away. The Ptolemy is completely destroyed, with only Sumeragi, Ian, and Felt making it out in time. Poor Chris and Lichty die in the attack. Man, this show really does know how to make the deaths of characters hit you hard. Alleluia and the Gundam Kyrios fight Soma and Smirnoff, but he can't overcome their teamwork. Even while utilizing Kyrios in Trans Am mode, he can't come out on top, and the Gundam is damaged with Alleluia only living because his alter ego, Hallelujah, sacrifices himself in a kind of weird and metaphysical way. Setsuna and Lasse attack the Golden Armor, the Alvatore, and destroy it, revealing that there's a gold mobile suit inside, which is pretty basic looking. Alejandro is kind of a sucky pilot, and he gets stabbed a ton by a raging Setsuna. While asking Ribbons and Veda for help, it's revealed that Ribbons always thought of Alejandro as a clown and a means to an end. He then lets him die. But the battle isn't over, as Graham shows up in the cool as shit GN flag and fights Setsuna in a battle where they both end up heavily damaged. In fact, we don't really know the outcome because both suits seem to be enveloped in a huge explosion. Man, the GN flag was a really cool suit, and I, I kind of wish it showed up for more than like two minutes right at the end. And so, season one of Gundam 00 comes to a close, with Celestial Being being utterly defeated. However, we do have to ask how much of this was actually according to plan. As far as we know, Aeolia Shenberg's plan was to unite humanity under one banner, and at the end of Season 1, all three economic blocks come together under the newly organized Earth Sphere Federation. But of course, the show doesn't end here. As we see, Saji has finally gotten his dream job of working in space. However, in the distance, Saji observes the familiar comet-like tale of a Gundam GN drive, and he's struck with the feeling that the ending to this story has not yet come to a close. Mobile Suit Gundam 00 is a show that actually really surprised me. I went in with some pretty high expectations, as it is the show that's been requested most out of any series in the Gundam franchise. Not only do I think it's an incredibly well thought out and beautifully animated action show, it also deftly weaves the stories of a ton of characters and factions in a way that keeps you invested, but also isn't super confusing. As such, I really do think that Gundam 00 is a great starting point for new fans of the Gundam franchise. You can go into it with very little knowledge of the franchise's history, and come away with a yearning to see more and maybe that's the best praise I could lay upon Gundam 00. At the end of the day, this show was really filled with characters I connected to and understood. People like Tiaria come off as harsh and unknowable during the first arc, but evolve into someone who's very human by the end, and it's easy to understand their motivations. Now, I definitely had to pass over some plot threads like Lu Mei being a person who plays both sides of Celestial Being and the whole thing with Graham's squad because there's just so much packed into the first season. But believe me, if you decide to give this one a go, I think that there's something here for anyone to like. Well, I didn't expect this video to be such a mouthful, and honestly I thought that splitting this subject into two separate videos for each season would have made it quite a bit shorter. Well, I was wrong, but hey, I'm not mad about it, and I guess I went a little bit more in depth than I planned to. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and rest assured I'm super excited to get to season two, because there's so much good setup that not talking about it would be a crime. So. I'll see you guys again soon for that discussion, and until next time, have a great day. Hey everyone, good morning. Well, at least it's it's morning for me. I'm recording this uh, after staying up pretty late doing a lot of editing, so if my voice sounds weird, it's because I, you people are the first people I've talked to today, actually. Um, well, first off, thank you very much to our channel members, as you can see on the screen, aka Batosai, Al Sturza, Brian Sanchez, D Mills, Danky Stank, Swanky Mank, Canto20, Nick Chase, Video Game Player 75, and Yo Yo Mach. 
Thank you guys very much for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed the Gundam 00 video, at least for Season 1. And we're moving right on to Season 2, which I really like. I really, really enjoyed uh, the first season of, of Gundam 00. I think it, now in my official ranking, I think I'd actually rank it right below Zeta as my second favorite, maybe third favorite behind G Gundam, because that one gets the extra nostalgia points. I think I'd, I'd rank it like second or third so far. That might change if I really don't like season two or like the movie or whatever. But anyway, uh, either way, what a fun time this was. And then in April, I'm going to be doing uh, a Awakening of the Trailblazer and season two and a couple other things. So stick around for that. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you very much once again, and we'll see you soon.